she's a mountain then you're an ocean hi everybody this is lori and i am the founder and ceo of a company called inclusivity i'm also the author of a new book you can save the world in fact you're the only one who can and this is our podcast inclusive talks sustainability and on our podcast we're really fortunate to speak with people who support sustainable living in a variety of ways as well as people who are incredibly creative and so for us sustainability means economic environmental and social justice so we have a host of interesting guests on the podcast today we're especially fortunate to have i'm going to read her name so that i don't get it wrong allison mcquinney from the Harry Edwards Healing Sanctuary in England. And so, Alison, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Laurie. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's such a pleasure. So I, I like to start out by just saying, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. Later, I wanna talk more about the sanctuary, but for right now, I'd like to talk about you. So tell us kind of how what you're doing now and how you got here. So currently I am the Director of Development at the Harry Edwards Healing Sanctuary and that is really all about, as we're coming out of the pandemic, um, promoting the sanctuary to wider audiences, um, talking about healing, how it's accessible for everybody, how it can really work um, as a complementary aid to seeking help from your doctor or consultant and um, really bringing more people to the sanctuary, both in person and um, on Zoom as well. Um, one of the things we really found about the pandemic, we took a lot of our meetings um, online via Zoom and we managed to reach so many more people throughout the world and our audiences at least trebled at events that we were holding. However, um, I've not always been in healing and if you'd asked me as a little girl, are you going to end up um, at a healing sanctuary? I'd have probably looked at you in total disbelief. It was never on my agenda whatsoever, but life can take you down routes that um, you never expected. And it's all about going with that flow. So I'd like to take you back to the year 2005. At that time, I was working in central London and out of the blue, um, I got a call from some friends with a very strange story who said that they'd been on a bus and that bus um, took them into a town centre, but also went on to a hospital. And the bus had been stopped by an ambulance and a doctor had boarded the bus and said, is Mrs. McQuinney on the bus? This is a life and death situation. And they had no idea what on earth was, was going on. And so rang me and said, we've no idea what's going on, but ambulances are chasing and stopping buses and looking for your mother. There could be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and th that was quite news to me as well. So I rang the local hospital and my mother was indeed at the local hospital. So I made my way there. And what had happened was she'd had a very routine um, blood test at the hospital. And the doctor had rung her and said, you need to go to hospital straight away. Um, I'm not happy about these blood test results and I'm coming in an ambulance to get you. And my mother was um, very Scottish and very, um, you know, I'm strong, I'm tough. I, I don't need to be ferried around. I will catch the bus. So off she toddled to the bus stop. Um, very fortunately, a neighbor happened to stop by and gave her a lift to the hospital. Um, but meanwhile, the doctor was en route in the ambulance and couldn't find her. And so was chasing buses heading in the direction of the hospital. When I got to the hospital, she was in recess and was in a very bad way. And the medical team were fighting to save her life. And she had a very irregular heartbeat and they were fighting to stabilize that heartbeat. And we were in recess for about six hours before they managed to achieve that. What the blood test had picked up was a very high potassium level, which is very dangerous for your heart. And she had also suffered acute renal failure. Um, she was moved from recess to a high dependency ward where she stayed for a week. And she then went on to a cardiac ward for two weeks before she could come home. I was told by the consultant that night that um, she would need dialysis. If she had any hope of getting better, she would need dialysis. Um, so I eventually went home about four in the morning 
And later that morning, I bumped into one of my neighbours and he and his wife were healers. And I'd known this for some time and not really thought anything of it, to be honest. I just thought, live and let live. Fine. Um, and he, the, Anthony, the husband, said to me, you look terrible. What on earth has happened? So I told him the, the story. And he said, right, my wife and I will um, send you both distant healing if you would like. And the situation was pretty down. I said, I will try everything. Um, and please do. So obviously I was going to the hospital on a daily basis and the results um, from my mother, which was taken on a daily basis, were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the consultants couldn't understand what was happening. Um, she never needed dialysis at all. The kidneys just started working. Yes, they were damaged. Yes, they'd been scarred by what had happened, but they were managing to work at such a level that actually she could live and she could live without dialysis. And um, so she eventually came out of hospital and her condition was maintained for quite a number of years before she became ill again. And that was my first experience of healing. Um, and what we say at the sanctuary is we would always say, continue to see your doctor, continue to see your consultant, but this can really help that process. Um, so that was my first experience. And, and because it, it gave me my mother for a few more years, um, I was very grateful and um, totally believed in it. Um, I never actually still imagined I'd end up working at the same sanctuary where these two healers had studied and qualified. <laughs> um, but fast forward to around 2013, 2014, um, my mother, who I called the wee mammy, sort of touching into the Scottish element, um, was getting elderly and with um, old age come certain conditions. And I took, um, I decided to take a career break to look after her and become her full time carer. Um, I was very fortunate to have a wonderful mother and I felt that she was getting on in age. These last years were precious. And I wanted to be there for her. And I also found the juggling of hospital appointments and the level of care required quite difficult to maintain with a full time job. And so something had to give. So um, I became her full time care in 2014. And throughout that time, I continued to ask for healing for her. Um, at that point, she had acquired 12 consultants over four hospitals for a whole variety of conditions. And time and time again, when I asked for healing, um, we would get consultants saying, these results are very strange. I did not expect them to be so good. Um, obviously, we couldn't cure mum because she was, you know, of a certain age and um, you can't sort of completely cure everybody. It depends on... Um, how the body is in its totality and old age was was creeping in um, but the healing really helped to stabilize her and give her a better quality of life in her final years and the consultants would say um, what is going on here because what we're doing would help but it wouldn't help to this level something else is at play what on earth are you doing so I sat there and I took a deep breath because um, they were very consultant type consultants, you know, um, very, uh, you had to really convince them about things and it had to be proven and all that sort of thing. And so I took a deep breath and said, right, I've asked some spiritual healers to give my mother healing, expecting to be laughed out of court. Um, and none of them did. And the stock answer that I got from these consultants was just keep doing what you're doing. We cannot explain what you're doing, but just keep doing it because it's working. And the reason that I'm not laughing at you is because it's showing in results um, that I do follow quite seriously. So that um, kept on happening. Um, one of the worst situations I had to deal with was my mother having a cardiac arrest in front of me mm -hmm. and I resuscitated her by myself. And um, she was in hospital, obviously, after that. And obviously, I asked for healing at that point as well. And quite often, um, healers will send healing 
if requested to the people caring for the sick person as well, because that's important because they're going through an awful lot of stress. And I can remember sitting by my mother's bed about a week after she'd been admitted to hospital. And I just suddenly felt this surge of energy coming at me, really warm, strong energy that made me feel much stronger in the situation I was dealing with. And I just felt I can deal with this. I can do this. Right, let's go. We're going to sort this problem out. And my, when I got home, my neighbour, Anthony, rang me and just said, oh, just checking in on you. Are you OK? And I said, um, by any chance, were you doing your thing at 2.30 p.m. this afternoon? And he said, yes, we were sending you distant healing. And I could feel it and not know that I didn't know that they were doing it at that particular time. Um, while I was taking a career break for about four or five years, I um, joined a number of boards as a trustee, charity boards. And my thinking behind that um, was twofold. First of all, these were positions that I could manage and look after somebody who was ill. Um, so I was free to attend the hospital appointments and be there for those. Um, and quite often, a lot of the work was done on computer at home. So it just fitted with the lifestyle at that time. And secondly, I felt that it would keep my hand in business while I was off so that when an opportunity came for me to return to the workplace, um, you know, I had been uh, practicing business skills and staying current um, and not out of that stream. And would you believe a vacancy arose as a trustee for the Harry Edwards Healing Sanctuary? And I thought, OK, here we go. Here we go. Um, so I applied for it and got it and became a trustee. And then I was asked to become a non-executive director of their trading company, um, Burroughs Lee Country House, which I duly did. And I did that for uh, a couple of years. And um, my mum passed over in 2018. Um, and then about uh, just under a year after that, an operations director role um, on the salaried staff became available. And I thought, well, I'm free to work again now. And having been on the board, um, I do know a lot about the sanctuary. I know how it works. So there's no learning curve as such. Um, so I applied for the role and uh, got it and started in May um, 2019. Um, obviously, the last year from March 2020 has been tough. Mm -hmm. um, it's been tough for all companies, all charities, all organisations. Um, and I was leading that on the staff front. Um, through that, um, which was obviously a very tricky uh, business phase. We pivoted quite a bit, taking um, events that we would run as um, income generating events in the sanctuary to online to try and help with the income flow. And I was constantly looking at how we could expand our horizons and reach out. Um, not actually looking for another job in doing this. I was just trying to keep the sanctuary going because I think I thought so many businesses are going under, so many charities are going under. Um, I'm in a, in a position of responsibility and I really want to keep this organisation alive and going. And the trustee saw what I was doing and felt that as we came out of the pandemic, what was needed was a director of development to really focus on keeping that momentum going. Um, and so my role changed in April of this year um, to really look at uh, reaching out, not only within Great Britain, but also internationally as well. Well, that's an amazing story. So I wanna ask a couple follow-up questions. One, what was your job before you, um, Took a, took a break to take care of your mom? So I had, um, I had a series of jobs since um, uh, leaving from having done my degree, which was in business. Mm -hmm. um, so I have been a retail manager okay. and I've also worked in, um, I worked in a couple of charities as well. So charity management. I specialized in um, human resources, mm -hmm. HR. 
And I also had experience of starting a company from a, for a former employer as well, opening a venue and running events as well, um, all based in central London. Okay. And you said as a child, you would, if we had, you know, if someone had said to you, are you going to be, a, you know, work for a healing agency at some point, you would have been, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? When, about <laughs> when you were a child, what did you think you wanted to do? Like, what were your, your sort of goals and aspirations at that point? Um, as a child, I wanted to, I did want to have a varied career. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't want to just have one career as soon as I, I finished my education. I actually wanted to experience um, a number of things um, and have quite a broad horizon. So actually, when I was in my 20s, I held down two jobs mm -hmm. um, and one of them was uh, full time um, working for um, a, a membership organisation for lawyers. And I also maintained... Um, a management position for a retailer as well mm -hmm. and the thinking around that was both organizations were very different and I was in my 20s and I was like a sponge and I wanted to absorb the knowledge but also the experience mm -hmm. um, it's not just about um, you know academic learning but it is about experiences and how you handle those experiences and what you can learn from those experiences um, and the cultures at both organizations were, were very, very different. And I just learned so much. And I just felt that um, I'm the sort of person who loves work. Mm -hmm. And so I never get that Monday morning feeling. Um, I actually really, you know, in all my jobs, I've really enjoyed the work that I have done. And I was just really hungry to learn from people who were older than myself and in more senior positions than myself. Um, and even to this day, although I'm in a more senior position than I was in my 20s, um, one of the things I love to do is look at successful people and um, see, you know, what are they doing to get to that level that I can learn from? Because um, you can always learn from people um, who achieve success in, in other areas to yourself. Um, and in many respects, you know, um, I'm one of those people, you don't want to be the most clever person in the room, because if you're the most clever person in the room, you're, you're not learning anything. You always want someone who, who is that bit much more than yourself, um, as well as people who are learning from you. It's always, always about a, a lifelong path of growth. So one of the things I love about your story is it's so clear how creative you are. Um, oh, and thank it's you. so clear how... Um, how much you love that learning process and solving problems. And even for your mom, when she, I mean, I would say that opening yourself up to that heat, those healers and saying, okay, I I'm open to this. I think even that is, it's a creative way of thinking. It's a way of thinking outside the box. Um, and it's yeah. a way of absorbing the world. And I, I, you know, I think you said you feel like you want to, you always want to be a sponge. Like you just want to soak up everything. And I just love mm -hmm. that. Um, are there any other ways in your life that you see yourself being creative? Um, I think I'm, I'm one of those people who, particularly if I've gone through something bad in life, mm -hmm. um, I try and sort of look at it. How can I help people um, who might be going through something similar? Um, the cardiac arrest in incident is a really good example of that. Um, now, at work, I had done first aid training. Mm -hmm. And um, in the UK, that lasts for three years, and then you have to requalify to make sure that your knowledge is still up to date. So I requalified three times, so thought that I knew first aid quite well. Um, but the dummy on the floor never prepared me for what you actually witness in a cardiac arrest. It really didn't. And I thought, well, I have passed this exam three times yeah. and I was taken aback and there were some things that I saw that I didn't know happened when cardiac arrest happen. And I can't be the only person who, to feel this. So um, I volunteer for the Met Police mm -hmm. and I do a lot of community work with them. And that's another story of how I got involved in that. But um, I thought, right, I'm going to organize some free events for my local community. 
And I'm going to ask paramedics from the London Ambulance Service to take these events and go through serious um, emergency first aid situations with film showing people having these various conditions so we can actually see what it looks like. Because I found like with the cardiac arrest, I was literally sitting having a conversation with my mother and the cardiac arrest hit out the blue, was not expecting it at all. Yeah. And um, I just thought, you know, this is really important information. If we share it, lives might be able to be saved. So I ran two events, they were free of charge for people to attend. I got funding for the venue hire. The police were in attendance as well because of the police connection and they were promoting crime prevention and community relations and all that sort of thing. And both events um, became completely full within 24 hours of uh, circulating the details. Um, but that wasn't the most amazing part. What actually happened at the second event was while the paramedic was talking about emergency first aid, one of the attendees fell off his chair and went into cardiac arrest oh actually at the event. So the um, paramedic obviously went straight into paramedic mode. The police were there and they came up to me and said, Alison, is this plan? I said, no, this is for real, please get help. So they were on the radio uh, calling for an ambulance. Now in London, uh, police cars, the emergency response police cars also um, carry defibrillators. Mm -hmm. So the first emergency personnel we had arrive were police officers with a defibrillator and they shocked this man back to life. And then the ambulance arrived and took the man away. And he, he, he lived, this in, he lived after this incident. Um, now, I never expected to organise an emergency first aid talk and have someone have a cardiac arrest at that talk. My inbox um, over the next 24 hours became absolutely full of emails saying, Alison, that was the acting at your course was just amazing. That was the most realistic first aid course I have ever been to. And I'm going, guys, that was for real. That was not acting at all. Um, but I'm glad you felt it was realistic, you know. Right. Um, so, um, but, you know, you, you just couldn't script it, could you? You really couldn't. No. Oh, that's incredible. So <laughs> you, you just, you feel to me like someone who is open to saying yes to opportunities when they present themselves. Yes. And are, are open to the world. Yes. And I think, um, I, I, and you can tell me if you agree, but I think healing has a lot to do with that. Just that openness to connection and to whatever the spirit or energy or whatever it is that connects us and connects mm -hmm. us with the universe. And Absolutely. so that, I love that. I love that about you. So Thank um, you. when you were a child, um, what was were there things in your childhood that you think ultimately opened you up to the whole healing path and where you are now? Do you think there were things that were just a part of your childhood? Yes, um, I had amazing parents mm -hmm. and he gave me a very happy childhood. But I think it's fair to say that the, um, my childhood was, was, was punctuated by um, hurdles that I had to overcome. Mm -hmm. So that actually started from birth. Um, when I was born, um, it was quickly realized that my skeleton had not grown properly. And my left leg in particular, the bone um, had outgrown the leg and sort of stuck out at an odd angle. And the first um, consultant who saw me um, expressed concern that I might never walk. It was that serious. And he'd never seen anything quite like this particular deformity. I think that there is definitely um, a higher power that helps us. And sometimes coincidences and synchronicities in life are just amazing. And obviously as a newborn baby, I was not influencing any of that, but I was very much helped by it. And I'll explain why. Um, my late father had been a journalist and a broadcaster. 
and um, he had spent time as a war correspondent attached to the British Royal Navy. And uh, during that time, he'd become friends with the then ship's doctor. This was during World War II. Fast forward to my birth, and that ship's doctor is now um, a very experienced and highly regarded leg bone surgeon operating out of Harley Street in London. Now, Harley Street is is the street for um, top-notch consultants. Okay. Um, and his, his name was Bob Shears, which I always thought was a very unfortunate name for a surgeon, but there you go. <laughs> um, so I was taken to see Bob, who also had never seen anything like this. And a month after I was born, there was a medical conference in London, and I got taken to that conference as a case study. Wow. And um, as a result of the feedback from that case study, Bob then operated on me when I was six weeks old. And um, I was under Bob's care for the first 15 years of my life. Obviously, lots of physiotherapy and exercises and regular checkups. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know for a fact, I mean, I can walk. Obviously, I'm not going to walk in this broadcast, but I can walk. I can walk well. Um, I know for a fact, for example, that um, my my whole skeleton has not grown in proportion. And I know this because when you are a child with a condition like that, they take x-rays head to toe. And what they're looking for is um, how your bones are growing in proportion to each other. There are special dimensions and, um, you know, whether there are any inequalities anywhere. And I know for a fact that um, I've been told that according to the size of my hip bones, I should be about five foot six, five foot seven, and I'm actually five foot one and a half, and that half an inch is very important, people. Um, so much smaller. That I've also got a slight curvature of the spine and um, a compressed spine, and that can lead to sciatica. Yeah. So whilst I won't be doing any backflips anytime soon, um, I can walk, and I, I lead a very... Um, good and normal life. I think there are several things that come out of that. Um, My consultant, Bob, amazing man, um, obviously came to this world with skills in um, operating on people and correcting bone deformities and bone issues. And I came along and he'd never seen anything like me before and didn't know what to do. But he took advice and he stepped up to the plate and he used his skills. And because of that, he changed my life for the better. So one of the lessons that I learned from that was the importance of, you know, we all come to this life with different skill sets. But it's always so important to really use your skill sets to their fullest, to really shine in this world with the reason you've come to this world, with the message that you have for this world and to help others, Um, not bring it to the table in in a kind of big headed way, but bring it to the table in a service way to help others. Um, You know, I'm I'm a very spiritual person and I I pray every day, twice a day, but it's also important to remember that sometimes you yourself are the answer to somebody else's prayer through your skill set. That was the first lesson I think that I took away from that experience. And the second lesson I think I took away, um, obviously my path to walking was slower than than would have otherwise been the case. And within that, um, that developed within me a sense of determination and tenacity because those were qualities that I needed to overcome the situation I I had been dealt and combined with amazing parents who were right behind me and encouraged me, encouraging me every step of the way. um, You know, I started walking and I started leading a normal life. Amazing. Other things that happened in my childhood that were punctuation marks. um, The next thing that happened was when I was four years old, um, when unfortunately my baby sister died very unexpectedly. Um, and that's very difficult as a four-year-old because you don't really understand death. 
um, I obviously had an enormous impact on my parents. And um, so it was something I had to overcome at a very early stage, not really fully understanding uh, what it was. And I know that I spoke to my mother sometimes throughout that, um, because obviously as a child, I would ask all the questions that were probably very difficult for grieving parents to have to deal with. Um, but I'd also used to pray for my sister. And apparently some of the words that I used spoke to my mother because they were much more mature than a four year old would normally say. Um, I can't actually remember what I said, but um, my mother did tell me that, that uh, she found it quite uncomfortable sometimes. Um, the next thing that happened was uh, when I was nine, my father became very ill mm -hmm. and um, it was thought that he had cancer of the lung and he had an operation and a third of his lung was removed. And I would say um, the next 11 years were full of um, his illness mm -hmm. and having to care for him with my mum. He had to give up work. She went out to work and I helped um, her look after him. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes as a child, that can be difficult because sometimes you're coming home from school and you find them unconscious on the floor and you have to take action. Um, so in some respects, that made me grow up before my years, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't know about healing at that point at all. So I wasn't asking anybody for healing. That had not hit my radar at that point at all. Um, but what I think all of that experience has given me, and uh, why I feel so passionate about healing and so passionate about the sanctuary, is I totally understand somebody who experiences loss through bereavement who um, is caring for somebody who is ill. Um, I totally understand what they're going through. And whilst people cope with those things in, in different ways, maybe, I, I do get the emotions and I empathize with them. And I think one of the things that I want to bring to the table in this lifetime is helping people going through tough situations like that. Um, and being at the sanctuary positions me uh, to do that very well. I love that. And that, um, that we're actually going to take a break. We're going to end this um, episode and we're going to continue with the second episode um, with you, Allison. Uh, I just want to say that I think that was a perfect ending because it really uh, speaks to sort of how you got to where you are, all the influences that brought you here. I love that message of taking care of others. And I would say that mm -hmm. we share a fundamental belief that that's why we're here, that we are here to spread that and to look out for the people and the, and the world around us. So I think it's a very good place to stop. When we come back in our second episode with Allison, we will ask Allison to talk about her life philosophy, any advice that she'd have for people coming up. And then I'm gonna ask you to share a story with us, Allison. So that will be in the next episode. So anybody listening, you're gonna to wanna to tune into that as well. So Allison, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this thank is you. Lori. This is Inclusive Talk Sustainability, and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.